Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck and you're very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks. And this week we're taking a look at a bit of an anomaly. A guitar brand that over the years has been played by some absolutely huge musicians, most notably of which the biggest selling band of all time. Yet, to myself and lots of guitarists that I know, remains a bit of an enigma. We're of course talking about Rickenbacker. <laughs> Growing up, I was absolutely mesmerised by the start of the Beatles' Hard Days and Night. Long before I had any concept of what a band was, or even what an electric guitar was, it had some strange hypnotic hold over me. I guess ultimately it would be Eric Clapton that would first introduce me to the idea of an electric guitar as a solo instrument, but on some cellular level I think that start of a Hard Day's Night was the first time that I vividly remember hearing music and realising the power that it could have. It's a chord that, I guess ultimately, is one of the most famous that has ever been committed to tape, and over the years that has been discussed and agonised over ad nauseum by musicians, guitarists the world over. And therein lies the contradiction. The most famous chord of all time was recorded on two instruments that, in the great pantheon of electric guitar discussion, barely factor in the conversation. So why isn't Rickenbacker a household name? The Rickenbacker story can be traced all the way back to 1918 with the arrival of one Adolf Rickenbacker. No doubt how it was pronounced, being spelt with a CH as opposed to the CK that he later changed it to, a more anglicised version of his name. He arrived in Los Angeles in 1918 from his native Basel, Switzerland. However, it wasn't until 1953 when he sold his company, the Rickenbacker Manufacturing Company, to one F.C. Hall, the owner of Radiotel, when Rickenbacker guitars as we recognise them today started to emerge. Their first electric guitar, the Combo 400, was introduced in 1956. However, it was the Pre 325 model introduced in 1958 that would unexpectedly go on to change the face of popular music forever when this happened. Ladies and gentlemen, the Beatles! <laughs> John Lennon bought his Rickenbacker 325, one of only 28 produced by Rickenbacker in 1958, to give you an idea of the size of their output at that particular point, during the Beatles' residency in Hamburg, Germany in 1960. The 325 is a rather unusual guitar in that for a semi-hollow body, it doesn't have any F-holes and at 5 8 scale is considerably smaller than a typical electric guitar. John purchased one of only eight models finished in natural and, upon his arrival back in Liverpool, changed the stock Kaufmann Vibrola to a Big speed. However, two years later, in September of 1962, it was sprayed black, more in keeping with Brian Epstein's vision of the band. 
However, it wasn't until February 9th, 1964, the Beatles' first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show, reportedly watched by over 73 million people, that the Rickenbacker name finally made its entrance onto the world stage. Company owner F.C. Hall, clearly recognising the impact of this performance, arranged to have John given another 325, George to be given one of their new 360 12 models, a 12 string notable for the alternate tuning pegs, a clever solution to the placement of the other six strings, and slightly later around the time of Beatles' performance at the Hollywood Bowl, Paul to be given a 4001 bass. Needless to say, the impact of the Beatles' performance on the Ed Sullivan show was seismic, and it wasn't long until bands on both sides of the Atlantic were clamouring to get a piece of the Rickenbacker action. One particularly notable example stateside, of course, being Roger McGuinn of The Birds, who, with his 36012, a guitar he bought after seeing George Harrison's in the movie A Hard Day's Night, a guitar that would go on to define the sound of the Birds' hits, Mr. Tambourine Man and Turn, Turn, Turn. It wasn't long until Pete Townsend had his, and throughout the late 60s, thanks to the British invasion, Rickenbacker became a name that was synonymous with the sound of popular guitar music. However, as the 1960s became the 70s, the characteristic jingle jangle of the Rickenbacker somewhat fell out of fashion, and surprisingly, it was actually the company's 4001 bass that became their hallmark throughout that decade. Of course, Paul McCartney used his extensively with Wings, Chris Squire, Roger Glover, Roger Waters for a period, of course, Lemmy, John Entwistle, Geddy Lee, Peter Quaife, Bruce Foxton, even Phil Linnett was seen with the 4001 when he wasn't playing Fender. However, after near enough a decade of indifference to the 4001 6 and 12 string counterparts, the near enough simultaneous emergence on either side of the Atlantic of Paul Weller with the jam and his 330, and of course Tom Petty, the album cover of Damn the Torpedoes, of course, featuring Mike Campbell's 62012, Rickenbacker was back, and in the decades that followed, the likes of REM, The Smiths, U2, Radiohead all heavily relied on Rickenbacker to get their sound. Of course, then, in more recent years, the likes of the Manic Street Preachers, Courtney Love, Kasabian, and more recently, Tame Impala, have again all been seen sporting Rickenbackers. So considering Rickenbacker guitars and basses have been responsible for some of the most iconic and endearing music ever recorded, why isn't the brand as big a name as, say, Fender, Gibson, or even more recent companies like PRS? And one thing people regularly point to is their price. Yes, they're not cheap, and they tend to be priced somewhere between the two and four thousand pounds mark, depending on model. But at heart, I think the one reason is infinitely simpler than that, and that is public perception. Rightly or wrongly, Rickenbackers are seen traditionally as rhythm guitars. Strats and Les Pauls do a bit of everything, Rickenbackers do jangly chords. I take the Borrow 330 that I'm playing in today's video. The nut width is virtually the same as a Strat or a Les Paul, but by the time you get to the 12th fret, it is considerably narrow, which, if you have larger hands, can lead to the sensation of crowding when you get north of the 12th fret. Now, to be honest, I didn't find it quite as difficult to play as I was expecting, given how much you do read about this as a, an issue with Rickenbackers, but it does take a little bit of acclimatization to get your head round, even more so considering it actually has 24 frets. There's also the enduring mystery of the fifth knob. George Harrison famously never quite figured out what it was for, and apparently Jim Hall, FC Hall's son, who now runs Rickenbacker, has been quoted as saying that it's rather redundant and would have been phased out by now if it wasn't for the outcry of the Rickenbacker purists. Now, it took a minute for me to try and get my head around it, but my understanding is, is that it operates as a second volume control for the neck pickup. Traditionally, the neck pickups on Rickenbackers are much hotter than the bridge, so a way of kind of balancing the discrepancy or the relative volume between each pickups was seen as essential. These days, not so much, but I'll try and demonstrate it in this next clip. Bye. <laughs> 
Lastly, considering Rickenbacker's incredibly rich and varied history, you couldn't exactly accuse them of overly relying on it, if at all, if I'm honest. It's rather surreal that they've done the odd signature model over the years, but presumably due to the size of the factory, they tend to be confined to limited edition runs, which of course drives the price up, putting them out of the reach of musicians who would more than likely be playing them on stage, thus spreading the Rickenbacker word. Rickenbackers in general are quite hard to come by, and a quick look at the websites of the few of the UK stockists more often than not shows the models either out of stock entirely or just available to order, or available to pre-order. And a quick look at Rickenbacker's own website transports you straight back to 1999. It's actually a treasure trove of information, but if you didn't know better, you might actually think that it was a defunct company with an archived website. I think all of this can lead to a sense that they're not really interested in pushing the brand. Although that said, at NAMM last year when I was there, their footprint or their presence or their stand was incredibly impressive, with every instrument that they manufacture being beautifully displayed. It's all just very contradictory, and I think the one thing that gets lost in the melee is that Rickenbacker are a company that make fantastically well-made guitars that truly do sound unique and have a voice all of their own. And if this video has done anything today, it's made me realise that I think I need a Rickenbacker. As ever, I'm Chris Buck. Thank you very much for watching Friday Fretworks. Please subscribe and hit the bell icon if you've made it this far. And I shall see you next week for another episode of Friday Fretworks. Cheers, guys. Take care. I'll see you soon.